In a few days it will be Eid al-Fitr, the holiday that marks the end of Ramadan. It's characteristically defined by charity and gift giving, and what's a better gift for your loved ones than a wonderful plate of biscuits? If you're new here, I'm Obi, and today I'm going to show you a traditional Middle Eastern biscuit called kahk that goes back centuries. They have a wonderful melt in your mouth texture, and I'll be showing you how to make and stuff them with both Turkish delight and honey coated nuts. Now let's get started. So our original plan for this video was to show you a recipe for Ghurayeba, which are traditional shortbread cookies that have a soft and crumbly texture. After a week of recipe testing, my wife and I concluded that we hadn't nailed the exact texture we wanted. So while we still have work to do there, we wanted to revisit the kahkalaid that we made last year. There's two different categories of kahk that you'll find in Egypt. One that is soft and crumbly throughout, and one that has a slight firmness to its exterior. If you want to make the ones with a slightly firmer bite, then check out last year's video, where we also made the traditional date and honey fillings. This time around we're going to fill the cookies with homemade Turkish delight, and we'll also do an updated agameya or honey filling using pistachios. You really could fill these with any filling you can think of, but these are the original flavours. We'll start off by making the Turkish delight filling, which in Egypt is known as malban. If you are able to buy ready-made Turkish delight, then preparing it will be really easy to do. Try to go for as neutral a flavour as possible, and I'd recommend either lemon or plain Turkish delight for these cookies. I could only get my hands on pomegranate Turkish delight, so that means it's time for me to make some, starting with a sugar syrup. Place a small pot on your stove and pour in 400 grams or 14 ounces of sugar. Next pour in 200 milliliters or 6.8 fluid ounces of water, as well as half a tablespoon of lemon juice. Turn the heat up to high and allow the sugar to melt completely. Once it does, turn the heat to medium high and you'll now heat this until it reaches the soft ball stage. When the sugar syrup reaches 112 degrees Celsius or 234 degrees Fahrenheit, it's ready to be used. Just add in your flavoring of choice and in this case, I went with one teaspoon of vanilla essence. I'd highly recommend using a kitchen thermometer to read the temperature as you don't want the syrup to overcook and reach the firm or hard ball stage. In another pot, add 80 grams or 2.8 ounces of cornstarch and half a teaspoon of cream of tartar. Next, whisk in and incorporate 300 milliliters or 10.2 fluid ounces of water as well as one tablespoon of lemon juice. Whisk this until no lumps remain and you have a smooth cornstarch slurry. Wait until your sugar syrup has finished cooking before you place this pot on the stove. Once it starts cooking, you'll have to move fast and add the sugar syrup. Place the pot on the stove over high heat and whisk this continuously until it thickens up. It will take about three to four minutes of constant whisking, but you'll soon be left with a mixture that looks like this. Cook it for a couple minutes further until it resembles glue. Now you can start incorporating the syrup. Pour some in and whisk this into the starch until well combined. Repeat that process a few times until you've used up all the syrup. You should now have a completely smooth mixture which has a light cream colour and it should resemble petroleum jelly. Turn the heat down to medium and you'll now simmer this for 45 minutes, stirring the pot about every 5 minutes. When the time is up, the mixture should have reduced to about 2 thirds its original size and it should have a thick syrupy texture like honey. Mix in a quarter teaspoon of salt and that is the Turkish delight done. Take a deep oven tray and line it with some greaseproof paper, then spread a small amount of oil all over the paper. Pour the Turkish Delight mixture into the tray and spread it out towards each of the corners. This now needs to cool for about 4-6 to six hours until it has safely reached room temperature. I sped mine up by putting it in the fridge after it had cooled down. To prepare store-bought Turkish Delight for stuffing, you can simply take the cubes and knead them with a little butter. In total for 500 grams of Turkish Delight, you'd need about 1-2 to two tablespoons of butter. Once you've kneaded this into the Turkish Delight, it will transform into a soft and workable ball of sticky fruit. This can then be divided into lots of small balls to be used for stuffing. In terms of the homemade malban, once it has cooled, I'd recommend cutting into cubes rather than trying to knead it. That wasn't a successful endeavour for me, and in the end I just roughly chopped it up into largish blobs. Whether you make the Turkish Delight or buy it, 500 grams will be enough for about 60 pieces of kak, so feel free to make less if needed. The other filling we're making is agameya, and this is a traditional honey nut filling made with sesame and walnuts. 
In their place we'll be using some bright green pistachios. To start I've taken 120 grams or 4.2 ounces of pistachios and I'm just rubbing them against each other to help remove their skins. Once you've removed as much skin as you can, chop the pistachios into chunks so that you split every pistachio into 2-3 to three pieces. When done your pistachios should look something like this. Now in a pot over medium heat, pour in 40 grams or 1.4 ounces of samna or clarified butter and allow it to melt completely. Once melted add in 20 grams or 0.7 ounces of all purpose flour and stir it to combine. Make sure you work out any lumps of flour and cook this for about 2-3 to three minutes, stirring the entire time. Next pour in 180 grams or 6.3 ounces of honey and stir well to combine this with the flour mixture. Cook this until it naturally comes to a boil, then add in the chopped pistachios from earlier. Mix well to combine and the agamea filling is done. Just pour this out into a bowl and allow it to cool completely for a few hours. When cooled it will have a firm solid texture and you can portion this out ready for stuffing. Just scrape the agamea with a melon baller until you have a roughly shaped ball. Then using your palms roll the ball into a soft and smooth sphere. In total the agamea stuffing will be enough for about 48 cookies. To make the cake dough is quite simple. We'll first start by combining all the dry ingredients. Add 1 kilogram or 35 ounces of all purpose flour to the bowl of your mixer. Then follow that up with 30 grams or 1 ounce of toasted sesame, which I toasted in a pan for about 2 minutes until it reached this colour. Next add in 70 grams or 2.5 ounces of powdered sugar and 2 teaspoons of baking soda. Follow that up with an eighth of a teaspoon of salt and finally we'll add the flavourings. The first one is 1.5 tablespoons of cac seasoning. This is a spice mix you can buy at spice vendors in the Middle East and I'll leave the ingredients for this in the description box. If you can't easily get some of the spices then I'd just recommend leaving them out and using what you have on hand. The second flavouring is half a teaspoon of vanilla powder. If you want to use vanilla essence instead then add it when we add the other wet ingredients. With all that in there you can finally mix together the dry ingredients. Don't be a muppet like me and make sure you don't pulse your machine and start it on the lowest setting. Once the dry ingredients are fully mixed, you'll now need to add 600 grams or 21 ounces of salmon or clarified butter. I showed you how to make this a few videos back in my dessert essentials video, which I'll link in the description box below. I know it may be tempting to use regular butter in this recipe, but if you do the biscuits will end up cracking and they'll dry out. When it has been added to the bowl, mix the ingredients together on low speed. It will form a rough biscuit dough, then it will quickly transform into a light and fluffy cream cookie dough. When it does, turn the speed up to medium high and whip this for about 2 to 3 minutes. When the time is up, you should have a wonderfully fluffy cookie dough that looks something like this. Turn the machine back on low speed and slowly pour in 180 grams or 6.3 ounces of whole milk, then knead the mixture for about 2 minutes further. To test the consistency of the dough, take a small chunk of it and roll it into a smooth ball in the palm of your hands. Using a finger press down and make an indentation in the centre of the ball. If it forms loads of cracks around the edge like this, then the batter hasn't been kneaded enough yet. Let the machine run in 30 second increments until you can roll a ball and press it without forming any cracks. In total my dough is kneaded for about 4.5 minutes and when yours is done it will need to rest for 30-60 to 60 minutes. When the dough has rested we can start portioning it out and assembling the cookies. Use a kitchen scale to get the weight of each cookie to around 20 grams and this ice cream scoop I was using is the perfect size for 10 gram measurements. If you want you can do slightly smaller cookies at 15 grams, before the stuffed ones I recommend 20 grams so there is enough biscuit around the filling. Once the dough is portioned out you'll want to take each chunk of dough and roll it into a smooth ball. In total this recipe will make about 94 20 gram cookies or 124 of the 15 gram size. So if you want to make less than that, you can cut the recipe in half. I've placed the balls of dough on a baking sheet lined with greaseproof paper, making sure to leave an even space around each one so that they can spread. To stuff the cookies take a ball of dough in the palm of your hand and make an indentation in the centre with your finger. Next place a ball of the agamea stuffing in the indentation and gather the remaining dough around the stuffing until it is completely covered. 
Try to get an even layer of dough around all the sides, then roll the ball in your hands until nice and smooth. For the Melban ones, it's pretty much the same thing. Just make sure to gather the dough around the filling before rolling the ball. Finally, before baking them, you'll want to mark the different fillings with some sort of pattern or indentation. There's a traditional way of doing this using these special kak tweezers, but honestly, I don't have the patience for that kind of decorative work. You can also use a mamul mold for this purpose, but they're two distinct kinds of biscuits, and I'd rather not confuse anyone. Instead, I would rather use a kitchen tool which has an interesting texture, such as this frying spider or a meat mallet. Using the spider, I press down onto my plain kak to leave an interesting indentation. These ones I didn't stuff, so you can use a bit more pressure when making your marks. For the stuffed ones, I only mark the agamea or honey nut ones, and only lightly as you don't want them to burst in the oven. Once you've finished the tray, place it in your fridge to cool for about 15 to 30 minutes, and this will ensure you get a nice and pronounced marking on the cack. Preheat your oven to 160 degrees Celsius or 320 degrees Fahrenheit with the fan running. When you're ready, remove your tray from the fridge and place it in the oven for 18 minutes. The stuffed ones need to cook for 2 minutes less, and when you take the tray out, the cookies will have spread a little and turned a light blonde colour. You should experiment to get the timing right in your oven, but you'll know the cookies are done when they have a slightly brown bottom and their centre has a dry crumb. You'll notice the stuffed ones have a more domed shape, which is why it's not always necessary to mark them and their markings have faded slightly because we used little pressure. You can actually see the difference between ones which were refrigerated and ones which weren't in terms of their markings. If one of them bursts, don't worry, it's still perfectly edible. When the cookies have cooled completely, you can now dust them with powdered sugar, and although it may look like a lot, consider that there's hardly any sugar in the cookie itself. The right amount of sugar is personal preference, though from experience they will absorb some sugar over the next few days. If your markings are well done, you should still be able to see them through the sugar powder. Now prepare yourself to see the greatest cross section that we've ever had on this channel. The Melbourne ones don't disappoint either, and given how little work is involved in making the dough and the stuffings, I'd say these are really impressive. They'll keep good for about 6 weeks in an airtight container, and they reach their optimal flavour and texture after 2 days. Now, let's check out the taste test. These are honestly my favourite biscuits in the entire world, and it's such a shame I only make them once a year. As soon as you take a bite, they start to melt in your mouth, and once you get to the filling, it's next level. I'm having a hard time choosing which filling is nicer, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. Do yourself a favour and make a big batch of these cookies. With that, we sadly come to the end of our twice-weekly Ramadan schedule. Eid Mubarak to all of you celebrating, and I hope you have a great time. If you enjoyed these twice-a-week episodes, then consider becoming a patron. I'd love to do this full time and your support will go a long way to making that happen. Thank you to all our amazing patrons for their support and I'll be back soon with another recipe.